Welcome back to Yesterday Today. I'm Jake, as usual. With me is McLean, as usual. As usual, of course. Yeah, this is the show where we bring you the best sounds of yesterday. Radio clips, mostly radio usually. We don't do any clips. Although I have a few I have a few things that aren't full-on radio shows today. But we'll get to that, we'll get to that. How you doing, McLean? I'm doing good, Jake. I'm excited about summer coming. This is the, the beginning of a new season. As Nat King Cole once sang, summer is a coming in. It's true. You know, the rains of spring are now dying down and giving way to the warm, balmy breezes. Balmy is right. It is It is humid here today, folks. Humid. I am a little sweaty, won't lie. <laughs> Maybe a little Jake, TMI there for you. Jake is all levels of disgusting today. Yeah, I guess so, but the air conditioning in the studio here is on the fritz, so it's a uh, little insufferable. Yeah. little insufferable. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, you know, I wasn't too concerned when we started when we started renting out this building last month in April, when it wasn't quite so so warm. It was still rather chilly. Um, now though, I'm getting a little concerned. There is a uh, on the floor above us. I think there's a um, somebody who makes like. Uh, they're like a baker or something. They have an oven going all day, and I think somehow the heat from that's just coming down or something. Something. Yeah, heat doesn't usually travel down, but in this case, we seem to be in an anti-gravitational building. Define the laws of physics. And speaking of summer, you know, it's the time of year when uh, graduation happens. Uh, kids are out of school. And uh, speaking of which... Okay, so here's the thing about me. I collect odd things sometimes. I have a collection at home of yearbooks. I collect old yearbooks, like 50s well, that's or older. your odd personality, Jake. Well, thank you. But, uh, yeah, I went to Oregon State University, and so I like to collect really old Oregon State University yearbooks. And one of them, I believe it was the uh, 1956 Beaver, the Oregon State Beavers, uh, the 1956 yearbook, in the back of it, I found this uh, this little uh, this little record that had been made to go to go with the yearbook, sort of like a uh, it, it's like an audio yearbook, um, and I was interested by this because, as far as I could tell, I've I've collected a lot of these yearbooks, and I could not find. I think this might have been the only time they did this. Uh, it was titled Oregon State's Year and Sound. I uh, hooked uh, hooked my old turntable up to my computer, dubbed it to a digital file, so uh, I could present it to you today. So there are I, I didn't do any like noise reduction on this so you can hear the the pops and clicks because it's a record so this is gonna sound absolutely awful gang well thanks for the vote of confidence mclean but this is uh oregon state here in sound 1955 1956 Uh, and i just i just thought it was interesting i really like it fun fact by the way before i play this there's a, a speech that's, oh, I forget who it is now, but there's a speech being given on this record by somebody at the university. Uh, how's it go again? Uh, I believe in Oregon State. I believe in the traditions and her ideals. And I recognized that for some reason. It, it was in my head. And I went back and that speech was actually used in a recent commercial for for the college. And the main thing I remember about that commercial is there's a shot of the science department where they have a horse on a treadmill. I don't know why the horse was on the treadmill. Yeah, yeah I remember the horse on the treadmill. I don't know. Oregon State is the leading leading school in uh, experimenting with horse speeds. So they uh, they used that speech for that commercial as, a, as like a backing track for it. And so I just, I found that really interesting that um, it came from this record. Well, it didn't come from this record. Obviously, they recorded it somewhere else. Anyway, here is uh, Oregon State's Urine Sound, 19, uh, 1956. These are the sounds of Oregon State College for the school year 1955-56. These are the events of Beaverland, recorded on the spot as they actually happened. And you were there. Up to the line of scrimmage, the Beavers spiral. The date, September 17th, and the first football game. Back spot, Barry at full, Segrist at quarter, and... Uh, Wesley at uh, left half. Here he goes, Wesley taking a take off, taking a handoff around, and he goes into the end zone for Oregon State, scoring the first touchdown of the game. Six, Oregon State, nothing, BYU. 
Now the Beavers trying to, uh, for that point after touchdown, with Francis holding and Wesley doing the kicking. Francis calling for the ball. It's down. It's in the air. It's a good. It's good. So the Beavers, the first flood, seven to nothing over BYU. The KOAC announcer explains the importance of the BYU victory. The final score, Brigham Young University nothing, Oregon State College 33. And as we commented a while ago after that last OSC touchdown, their fifth, that is the largest advantage uh, held by an Oregon State team in uh, almost five years. Back in 1951, uh, OSC beat another team from Utah, the University of Utah, Salt Lake City, 61 to 28 for a 33-point advantage. And uh, that marks the first victory for Oregon State College since their opening game one year ago today. And, of course, uh, the first victory for Tommy Prothrow as head coach of Oregon State College in this opening game at Parker Stadium in Corvallis for 1955. September 22nd, and Dr. Sheldon of our own chemistry department addresses the new Beavers at the Freshman Pledge Convocation. I believe in her traditions a heritage from the deeds and dreams of yesterday. I believe in her sportsmanship and honor, a reality with the students of today. I believe in her aspirations and her ideals, the assurance of a magnificent tomorrow. September 23rd, and on Coleman Field, the annual freshman mix and picking up pawpaws. October and homecoming week. The noise of the winning parade float of Alpha Omicron Pi, Kappa Delta Rho, and Pi Kappa Alpha as the winners came down Monroe Street that night. Remember the midnight show and Phil Carlin? Midnight Show, the presentation of the Homecoming now Queen for 1955. To introduce to you the students and alumni of Oregon State College, your 1955 Homecoming Queen, Queen Jeanette McDonald of Delta Delta Delta. I hardly know what to say except thank you, and oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Queen Jeanette. The three spades created quite a sensation on the program with their own special brand of harmony. A 
of a girl who left me standing, standing in the cold. Well, since she's been away, I've never had a happy day. That she'll hear my plea And maybe someday She'll come back to me Well, here in my heart There's a story untold And remember Barbara Bogues, Birth of the Blues? October 22nd, a beautiful day for the homecoming football game. First and goal to go for the Beavers on the Washington State College Cougars, one yard line. And up come the orange and black boys. Moving offensively, one yard to go for Pater. Francis carrying the ball wide around his left end, goes in untouched, and he scores. Another touchdown thrill and a fine homecoming battle as the Beavers set up their second and last touchdown of the game. The Beavers moving from their own nine, and the ball is snapped to Francis, who runs hard over his left guard and down to about the two. Joe Francis really boomed. The Beavers now, first and ten, first and goal to go on the two. Their single wing right. The ball is snapped to the full, who dives for the touchdown and gets it. The ref signals. The Beavers lead 13 to nothing. Listen to the crowd. Trying now for the extra point after that Beaver touchdown, Joe Francis will hold for Cyril. The kick is, the ball is down and the kick is in the air. It is good, good. So the Beavers go out in front, 14 to nothing. The final score, Oregon State 14, Washington State 6. Football fever was high all season as Tommy Prothro, our new coach, brought the Beavers undisputed second place in the Pacific Coast Conference. We want Prothro! We want Prothro! Oregon State College Charter Day, October 27th, and the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska gives the keynote address. I have always been tempted to dwell upon the importance of the land-grant decision because it was revolutionary. It broadened educational opportunity it opened the doors of higher education to professional training. It united research and teaching in higher education. It cleared the way for the Agricultural Extension Service and the introduction of vocational courses into the high schools. Honorary degrees were given to Luang Suan of Thailand and Douglas McKay, Secretary of the Interior. Here is Mr. McKay. Dr. Strand, Governor Paul Patterson, distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, I'm proud and honored today to receive this honorary degree of Doctor of Laws from Oregon State College. I shall always cherish it, just as I cherish the memories of four years spent here and several years in the service of the Alumni Association. But I want to assure you folks, it was much harder to get that first degree. <laughs> December now, and Christmas on the Oregon State College campus, as the Department of Music presents the Messiah.
one of the big dances of the year, January 14th, 1956, and the military ball. Perhaps you were there as the dancers honored the Little Colonel. And it is my pleasure to announce that the Little Colonel for 1956 is Miss Donna McCoy. <laughs> Except the same two words everybody else always says, and that's thank you very much. There were many fine convos in 1955-56. Remember Dr. Robert Hutchins? Now, the spread of this principle of education for all is, of course, associated with the spread of democracy. Nobody now dares to say that democracy isn't the best form of government. The democratic faith is faith in the people. But it assumes that the people are enlightened, that they understand the principles that underlie good government, and that they understand the issues that arise from day to day in building and maintaining it. On February the 11th, 1956, Jerry Christofferson was crowned king of the mortarboard ball. And the next week featured Dad's Weekend. On Saturday afternoon in the Coliseum, you heard the inter-sorority sing. Remember Lullaby of Broadway, as sung by the Pie Fies? Come on along and listen to the Lullaby of Broadway, the Boogie Beat and Bebop too, the Lullaby of Broadway. The band begins to go to town, beep, beep, and everyone goes crazy. You rock by your baby round till everything gets hazy. Hush, I'll buy you this and that, you hear daddy saying. And baby goes home to her flat to sleep all day. Good night, 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 Remember the Oregon-Oregon State game at Eugene on March 9th? Oregon 67, Oregon State 72. We have 42 seconds remaining. It's up again and good. Very nicely by Wimp Hastings. Beavers lead by four. Pierce Haynes giving to Wilson. Wilson holds the ball, dribbles it now. Stands out front, gives to Crimmins. Crimmins goes by on the dribble, gives to Haynes. Back to Crimmins. Crimmins holds the ball. Back out to Haynes. It's intercepted by Johnny Lundell. Taken back away by Crimmins. And now a jump ball is called. Wait a minute. No, it's a foul. It's a foul on Jerry Crimmins of Oregon State. His fourth personal foul of the evening after coming into the ball game with about seven minutes to go. And it sends Wimp Hastings to the free throw line again for Oregon. Hastings has just made two out of two. He puts this one in. Oregon 69, Oregon State 72. Wimp Hastings hitting those free throws now in the crucial moment. It's up again. It's in and out. Rebound by Wilson for Oregon State. 15 seconds. Here comes Crimmins. Gives them off. Thunder for the layup. It's good. And Bob Allard grabbed the rim and fell down. Ross gives it to Hastings. And Oregon took the ball across the line and bringing it inbounds. Four seconds remain. The Beavers will have the ball. One. None. It's over. Oregon State wins. Bob Allard just threw the ball way up into the crowd with a big underhand toss. The crowd throws it further up into the crowd. Final score, Oregon State 74, Oregon 69. On the next night at Corvallis in the Coliseum, the Beavers beat the Ducks again to win the Chancellor's Trophy for the fourth year in a row. Perhaps this uproar brings back memories as the Chancellor presented the trophy to team captain Larry Paulus. Date, April 4th, and the sixth session of the Model United Nations. Mr. Sprague, former governor of Oregon, opened the first plenary meeting of the General Assembly. I am highly privileged to serve the sixth session of the Model United Nations 
in the capacity of its presiding officer at the plenary session. It is a high privilege, and I am happy to be with you, to greet you, and to mingle with you, and to assist in whatever way I can in making this a great success. symbolizes the spirit of Oregon State College, as expressed in music by the Choral Errors. 1955-56 was a year of outstanding achievement. You will find the complete story in your yearbook. As you turn its pages and as you play this record, may our story of Oregon State College in sight and sound help you relive the pleasant memories of which you were a part. That was Oregon State's Year in Sound, a special uh, record that went out with uh, yearbooks in 1956. Uh, I, I imagine that wasn't too terribly interesting for a lot of you, so uh, if you skipped ahead past that in your uh, podcast app, whatever you use to listen to the show, I don't, I don't blame you. But now, McLean will have something for us in a minute after I play this next clip I have queued up. This, is, uh, this has nothing to do with summer. <laughs> I just, Ooh, I just enjoy little, this. Pull a little fake out on me there. I, I know, a little bit of a fake out on you there. Sort of, sort of departing from the theme a bit. This is a uh, clip of the CBS Radio Workshop. Uh, it's, it's just titled "Audio Files." I'm not sure what episode it's from. I, I found it searching for, searching for uh, Stan Freeberg material. Stan Freeberg, of which McLean here is a huge fan. He was a. Yeah, he was a comic. Uh, later, he, he's I think he's most well known for the advertising work that he did. But he had his own comedy radio show uh, in the 1957, I believe it was. Yeah, Stan Freeberg's one of those guys where you could like go on his Wikipedia page and see like author, writer, comedian, uh, advertising agent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's got so many different uh, man of many char- hats ch- characteristics. A man and I believe he hats. I believe he died just recently too. I. It was about 2014. Yeah, okay, it recently not, to me. It was about, yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. almost 10 years ago now. Um, I do remember the day distinctly, however. Because uh, the summer before, I had just really gotten into Stan Freeberg after hearing his radio show that lasted for one season on CBS. And then I had gotten into all of his other stuff, too. And uh, that's when he passed away. So, so this is a, a clip from the CBS Radio Workshop. And I think Stan Freeberg was hosting it or something. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't researched this clip too much. Terrible of me, I know. But uh, in it, he's uh, poking fun at audio files, which were a thing even back then. People would get really into uh, their audio stereo equipment and stuff like that. Um, and it reminds me of a lot of people I have encountered on on the internet. So uh, yeah, this is a clip from CBS Radio Workshop. Stan Freeberg. <laughs> Radio station WHIFI-FM, serving the greater Milltown area, is once more proud to bring with this time your weekly high-fidelity forum of the air. And here is your moderator, Feedback Frugal. Yeah, thank you. 
Well, every week at this time, I have to ask all you people listening on anything less than a 15-inch speaker with an 8-inch tweeter to tune out, please. We don't mean to be undemocratic, but we're a select group, and we can't have just anybody listening. Thank you, so get out, please. Well, tonight our panel looks a little bit like who's who in (laughs) hi-fi. To my right, Mr. H.H. Horn, president of the Summit Ridge Louder and Louder Club. Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn? Oh, oh. Uh, and to my right, Mr. Dacron Grillcloth, editor of Assemble It Yourself magazine. Uh, Thank you, and good evening. And on my right, a very charming teenager, Miss Rhoda May Flogg of the West Branch Falls branch of the Johann Sebastian Bach fan club. I believe that's the inscription on your windbreaker, Miss Flogg. I hope your ears are better than your eyes. It says, don't knock Bach. That's the slogan of our club. Oh, that's the slogan. I yeah, think. we have jerseys, too, that say, every toccata is worth a few. Fine. Thank you, Miss Flood, for the plug. Well, that's our panel. Now, first, we'll play just a teeny bit of a brand new LP recording and see who'll be the first to identify it. Here we go. I think you'll find it works better if you remove the record jacket first. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's my mistake. Here we go. Sturdy jacket. Well, there we are. Now try and identify this. Well, that's about enough of that, I guess. Oh, sorry. Well, my my arm slipped. I'm sorry. Now, do you know uh, who that was? H. H. Horn had his hand up. Uh, that was played over a Pimlington amplifier model 220. Right so far. The Philly preamp and Magnus torn on. What do you mean a Philly preamp? That had over 1.6% hum. You can't get that kind of distortion out of a Philly. My dear Miss Blue, I can hear up to 20,000 cycles. All I right. Hey, 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 all right. I'm afraid Miss Plug has got you there, H.H. Right. <laughs> it was a Murdoch Jr. with over 2% hum. Now, what about the turntable, Mr. Uh, Grillcloth? Uh, yes, well, it has quite a bit of rumble in it. I think it was the new Murdoch just on the market. Right you are. Do you think it'll sell 200000 No, no. They have quite a few bugs in them yet. I got a Murdoch. It doesn't have any bugs. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, they've got a rumble like a cement mixer. Well, sure they do if you don't use a foam rubber spindle adapter. All right, all right. Did anybody recognize the music? Uh, tell you the truth, I wasn't listening to the music. Uh, me either. Well, no matter. Now we come to our contest. <clears throat> If you can guess the sound, you win a life-size inflatable latex rubber Liberace. He comes with his arms extended, ready to be blown up and set down at your own piano. Oh, Gee, that's well, yeah, now what familiar sound is this? Listen. <laughs> Well, I don't see any hands. That was Benny Goodman in a skin diver suit, 20 feet underwater, playing Danny Boy in a kelp bed. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't think should have that. H.H., oh, you yeah. should have had that. Well, now one more just quickly here. Recognize that sound? Hmm? I think that was a... Uh... No, I give up. Yeah, what was that? That was King Farouk in a skin diver suit, 20 feet underwater, applauding Benny Goodman. Oh, well, if you'd played that on something beside a lousy Murdoch turntable without all that rumble, I, what I think that I would What do you mean, lousy Murdoch? I'd like to hear your turntable. All now. right, Miss Plug, you'll have an opportunity right now. Mr. Grillcloth has assembled his home hi-fi kit here in the studio, and we're all going to get a little listen, right, Doctor? Uh, yes, yes. As advertised in our magazine, assemble it yourself. Now, of course, in order to prepare for our kit, you have to rip out all the walls in the interior of your house. I see. Uh, next, our acoustical walls go up in sections. Prefabricated. Well, more or less. One wall is solid tennis balls. The other is asbestos. The third, wet bathing suits. And the fourth, a um, sort of a foam rubber bar-relief mural of the Pickin sisters in repose. Mm, some acoustics, right? What about equipment? Well, I use 521-inch speakers in the ceiling, as you can see here. I yes. have it all set up there. Uh-huh. Plus a 10-foot horn enclosure in each corner. I have a Style Master preamp in a Farmroy turntable. Oh, the waste one he could have picked. Listen, madam, people who own Murdoch turntables should not... All right, now, now, how much does all that equipment cost? I know our listeners will be uh, anxious. Yes, well, I'll tell you. Find out the... Yes, please, I'll I'll tell you. 5,499.50 takes it home. 
course, the cost of building the railroad spur right to your house, which is essential, is not included. Not in included that. in the price. Well, could we hear a little music through your system? I, I see you have it all set up. No, 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 no. No, I'm afraid it wasn't designed for this studio. Oh, that's a shame. No, the room won't stand the stress. Oh, I think it would, but uh, I'm sure our listeners would have enjoyed hearing sure, it. Oh, I yeah. would have enjoyed hearing it. Mm, no, not me. This way I don't have to hear that more than 5% turntable rumble in that lousy farm noise. Uh, just a minute, Miss right, Smart Alex. Yeah, all you right. just take the panel. Here, Mr. Blog, put your windbreaker back on, please. Oh, yeah, all right, yeah. you, you want to hear a little hi fi, eh? Well, listen to this. <laughs> concludes our weekly High Fidelity Forum of the Air. Now back to the frothy beat of Claude Hopper and his boys. All right, that was Stan Freebert doing a little, uh, little poke and fun at audio files on CBS Radio Workshop. And now, McLean, I believe you have a program. Yes, Jake, I do, and I'll present this, and you know what, um, do you think you could, like, maybe, uh, while I'm doing this, do you think you could, like, call the landlord or something about this, yeah. uh, about this heating oh, problem? Yeah, like, yeah, have, yeah, 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 I will. We have the yeah, windows open in here and everything, and it's still not even working. It's supposed to cool down by next week, I think, it's just a little heat wave, but if it doesn't get any better, I might just have to bring, like, a couple of fans from home or something, it's bad. Well, uh... <clears throat> Further focusing on our theme of welcoming summer, which Jake somewhat departed from in that last clip, we have an episode of the Ford Theater here. Uh, the Ford Theater, I, I don't want to just write it off, but um, kind of in the vein of a lot of the shows that kind of tried to mimic or copy Lux Radio Theater with the reproduction of popular films of the day. Ford Theater is kind of interesting, however, because it was not focused mainly on the radio version of it. Um... In fact, the radio series of the four theaters only lasted for two seasons. And then at that point, the show was not doing well in the ratings. So they transitioned and focused entirely on television. And that series actually lasted for eight seasons from 1948 to 1957. But we have here an episode of the radio program from its first season. Uh, They're presenting an adaption of the famous stage play slash film as well there was a movie made of Ah Wilderness by Eugene O'Neill this is kind of famous for being Eugene O'Neill's only comedy and it's his only play where there's a happy ending involved Uh, spoiler there is a happy ending in this Eugene O'Neill play but yeah this is one of my favorite plays I appreciate kind of the small town aspects of it Uh, it takes place on the 4th of July in the summer in 1906 in a New England town and the main character Richard is 16 years old, and the youthful idealism of teenagers comes face to face with uh, the harsh reality of the real world, to some degree. And you see kind of kind of this coming-of-age story of this uh, this kid having to uh, learn what is and isn't proper for the day. And it, it's, for the most part, a, a carefree tale. It's um, a happy, cheerful picture of small-town life. And so with that, here is the Ford Theater's presentation of Eugene O'Neill's Ah Wilderness. This is the Ford Theater, an hour of radio drama presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, tractors, and buses. Welcome to the Ford Theater. Your customary seats, the best in the house, of course, are yours again today. 
This afternoon, we shall hear Eugene O'Neill's Our Wilderness, a gentle comedy set in America's Age of Innocence, the incredibly remote years before the First World War, when most of us were young and some of us were gay. The year of the play, to be exact, is 1906, when Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House, when automobiles were horseless carriages, and the Gibson girl was the final word in glamour and grace. Where your radio cabinet now stands, it's possible to imagine a brass-rimmed family gramophone playing those cylinder-shaped Edison records. These, then, are the good old days, and this is the Ford Theater version of Our Wilderness. we want you to meet Richard Miller, aged 16, a promising young man, but at this period, somewhat mixed up in his mind about life and love and all that. Richard lives in a small New England town, which might very well be a small town anywhere. We meet Richard on an auspicious occasion. It's the glorious morning of the glorious 4th of July, 1906, and the hour is just past sunrise. Everyone of sense is still in bed, naturally. You see, don't you, Muriel, that this is a very grave moment? It's a very grave moment in our lives. Oh, yes, Dick. As a matter of fact, you could almost call it an awful moment. Awful? Richard Miller, after I sneak out of the house at the crack of dawn just to meet you here on the beach so we... I'm could... using awful in the Elizabethan sense, Muriel. As Shelley would have used it. Meaning... Full of awe. Oh. oh. I hope my father isn't up yet. If he finds out I sneaked out to the beach before breakfast... Your father is insignificant, Muriel. In the scheme of things. Oh, excuse me. You do agree, don't you, Muriel, that it's important for two people who are going to be married when one gets out of Yale to see the sunrise together? Oh, of course I do, Dick. Only... Only what? Well, couldn't we find a nice flat rock to sit on? Do we have to sit on such a pointy one? It's more significant to see the sunrise from a wild shoal. Oh, I see. What are you thinking of right now, Muriel? Oh, I was wondering what my mother was going to make for breakfast. I didn't have time to eat before I met you. Breakfast? At this highly historic moment in our lives, you... Don't you care anything at all about life, Muriel? You know I do, Richard. Only I'm hungry. Oh. And if my father finds out I sneaked out to meet the you... The brave man has to give his life away. Give it like a royal heart. Let the price be nothing. What's that, Dick? Another poem? That's from Carlyle's French Revolution. You're terribly wild and free, aren't you, Dick? Oh, not so much. Well, I guess we better start for home before your folks begin worrying about you. Well, what about your folks? My folks? My folks are too sophisticated to worry about practically a college man. Where can he be, Nat? I'm terribly worried. No, Essie, I told you, there's nothing to worry about. Richard is probably out catching a fish for breakfast or something. This may be the period when he eats nothing but what he catches himself. You should know your own son by this time. But going off without his breakfast, he's a growing boy. Uncle Sid didn't come down to breakfast either, Ma. Is Uncle Sid... Uncle Sid didn't come down to breakfast because he had a hangover. Arthur? Yes, Mother. And Mildred, finish your milk. Oh, I'm full, Ma. Can I go out now? I want to set off my firecracker. It's too early in the morning. Oh, let her go, Essie. Hey, thanks, Pa. Only see that you set off your firecrackers away... I don't know which is worse, Mildred banging doors or Richard trying to live like some character from Dostoevsky. That reminds me, Nat. I've been meaning to speak to you about those awful books Richard's been reading. Oh, not today, Essie. Not on the four. Well, you'll have to give him a good talking to, and today's as good a day as any. I'll go get them right now. I found out where he hid them, on the shelf in his wardrobe. Mm, Pass the cream, will you, Arthur? Sure, Dad. Thank you. Uh, while we're on the subject, Dad... Now, I... Arthur, you're not going to tell me something fresh and horrible about Richard. I couldn't stand it. Well, it's pretty darn disgusting the way Richard's been mooning around that McCumber girl. Now, 
when I was his age... Don't tax your memory, Arthur. Well, it's pretty darned embarrassing, I tell you, for a man to come home on his summer vacation from Yale and see his own kid brother... Why, Pa, he's making a darn fool of himself. Do you know what he's doing now? He's reading poetry to that girl in broad daylight. I can see how that would upset you. Well, it's pretty darn disgusting. Don't tell me who you're talking about. I know. Oh, good morning, Uncle said. Morning, Bula Bula. Guess I made a pretty disgusting picture at dinner last night, Matt. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Sid. <laughs> you were pretty funny, though, when you wore the lampshade on your head, Uncle Sid. Oh, <laughs> was Essie awful mad? Not especially. Lily acted kind of quiet, but uh, she didn't go home early the way she usually does when you're, uh... <coughs> I, uh... You proposed to Lily over the lobster, Uncle Sid, uh. and she said it was Providence that made her turn you down for a teaching job 16 years ago. Ken, Arthur, didn't you say you were going to celebrate the 4th in a special way this year? What? Oh, yes. <clears throat> I'm uh, <clears throat> taking Ethel Ryan canoeing. Well, don't you think you ought to start, son? You don't want to keep her waiting. Oh, that's true, too, isn't it, Dad? I, I guess I'd better get going. So long, folks. So long, son. And uh, if you see Richard anywhere, tell him to come home at once. Tell him I want to talk to him. <laughs> What the devil is that? That's it, is Richard. My youngest son is the only human being I know who can fall upstairs. Richard! Yes, Father? Come in here. Anything wrong, Father? Where have you been? Your mother's been worried to death about you. Woman's life is filled with fear. Each frightened moment lasts a year. Well, that puts things in their place. Just for this morning, Richard, will you try to spare us the full extent of your profundity? Where have you been? Watching the sun come up over the ocean. Alone? With Muriel McCumber. I was reading to her out of Carlyle's French Revolution. I'm sure she was fascinated. What's that, Uncle Sid? I'm glad you're reading Carlyle's son. It's a darn fine book. Have you read it, Pa? Uh, well, I'll tell you, Richard. Sometimes even a broken-down old newspaper publisher can't get out of reading a book or two. Oh, Pa, I didn't mean... I know you... Say, isn't it a great book? That part about Mirabeau. And Marat and Robespierre. Never you mind about Robespierre, young man. Where have you been? Oh, no place, Ma. He had to clock the sun in this morning, Essie. You, Sid, can be ashamed, too. Well, I... I Promising I... to take Lily to the bonfire last night, then coming home, or... Well... You may be my own brother, Sid, but I tell you, that's no way to treat your fiancé, even if you have been engaged for 16 years. I, I, I didn't mean to do it, Essie. I just stopped off for... I know what you stopped off for. Now, I think you'd want to make up to it. Something awful. What to do, Essie? I'm going to. Well, she's waiting on the back porch for you. Go ask her to come on an automobile ride. Tell her Nat's going to drive to the lighthouse. Oh, Essie. Sid and I are going to the Sachem Club picnic. The Sachem Club picnic isn't until later. Go on now, Sid Davis. Well, My own brother acting that way with his own fiancée. Well, sure, Essie. I was going to ask her anyhow. Gosh, you didn't think I wasn't going to ask her, did you? Mm. I was going to ask her anyhow. How that woman has put up with him for all these years. Now, young man... Where are those books? What books, Ma? You know very well what books. They were on the shelf in your wardrobe. Now you've gone and hid them somewhere else. You go right up and bring them to your father. Oh, but I... Oh, he doesn't really have to go and get them now, does he, Essie? We can look at them some other time. And besides, he has a right to keep his library to himself. Nat? Uh, well, that is, if they're not too, uh... What books are they, Richard? Oh, Pa. Well, I'll tell you what books they are if he won't. There are two books there by that Oscar Wilde. The one there was all that hullabaloo about. Don't remember what. There's some kind of ballad there about a fellow runs around killing his best friend. The Ballad of Red and Gold. One of the greatest poems ever written. Fine reading for a young boy. There were two books there, Nat, by that Bernard Shaw. And a book of poems by that Swinburne. Poems and ballads by Swinburne, Ma. The greatest poet since Shelley. Why, he tells the truth about real Love? Love? Well, all I can say is if he wasn't flung in jail, a mistake's been made in justice. The things he says, Nat. But there was another one. Something called the Ruby... Uh, what is it, Richard? The Ruby out of Omar Khayyam. Hmm. That's the best of all. I've read that, Essie. Why, Nat? Matter of fact, there's some fine things in it, seems to me. True things. Well, Nat, I don't see how you... Gee, it's wonderful, isn't it, Pa? A book of verses underneath the bow. A jug of wine, a loaf of bread, 
and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Did you have your breakfast, Richard? Oh, Ma, for Pete's sake, is that all you can think about, food? When a man's concerned with matters of the soul, as he... All I asked was if he had his breakfast. Who cares about food? Well, I had a slice of ham, a couple of eggs, a bowl of cornflakes, a banana, and a sardine sandwich, but who cares about food? Food means nothing to me. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. You want the wrench, Pa? Not yet, Dick. I've got to raise the auto first. Give me the jack handle, will you? Oh, here you are, Pa. You almost ready, Nat? Bessie wants to know. What's she say? It's Lily. She wants to know if you're almost ready, Ma's asking. Any minute, tell her. Any minute, Lily. Uh, how many miles is it to the lighthouse, Pa, about? About 20 each way. I'll take the wrench now. Here, Pa. Boy, you sure have to be careful on a long trip like that. You sure don't want any tires blowing out, do you, Pa? Oh, Mildred and her firecrackers. Richard, you run tell her to take them out back. All right, Pa. Tell her to... Say, who's that coming up the walk? It's Mr. McCumber, Pa. Well, now, what do you suppose he'd want at this time of day? It's to complain about something, that I know. But what? Uh, I'd better go tell Mildred, Pa. Well, Dave McCumber, what good wind blows you around this glorious fourth? I regret to say, Nat, that it's something disagreeable. Disgraceful would be nearer the truth, and it concerns your son, Richard. Oh, come now, Dave. I'm sure Richard hasn't... He has, and I have proof of everything in his own handwriting. Well, now, hold on a minute. Proof of what? Just uh, what is it you're charging him with? With being dissolute and blasphemous and with deliberately attempting to corrupt the morals of my daughter, Muriel. Then I'm afraid I'll have to call you a liar, Dave. I thought you'd get around to that, so I brought the proofs with me. I've got them right here in my wallet. My wife found them in Muriel's handkerchief drawer. You'll see, they're all in his handwriting. Well, what's in his handwriting? What are you talking about? Muriel's confessed to me that he wrote them. You read them and then say I'm a liar. Here, read it. What the devil Haven't you? have been too busy to take the right care of Richard's upbringing, or what he's allowed to read. Look there. My life is bitter with thy love. Thine eyes blind me, thy tresses burn me, thy sharp sighs divide my flesh and spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Why, you darn old fool. What, you... Can't you see that Richard's only trying to show what a young hellion he is? <laughs> Why, at heart, Richard is just as innocent and as big a kid as your Muriel. Oh. This stuff doesn't mean anything to me. And if you believe it could corrupt Muriel, then you must believe she's easily corrupted. Now you're insulting my daughter. I'm not insulting her. I'm giving her credit for ordinary good sense. I knew you'd prove obstinate, Nat. But I never dreamed you'd have the impudence to claim that your son was innocent of all wrongdoing after reading those papers. No, well, just what did you dream I'd do? Take and give that boy a hiding he'd remember to the last day of his life. I've had enough of this day. Now, you need to lose your temper. I'm only demanding you do your duty by yours as I've done by mine. I'm punishing Muriel, and yet she's blameless compared to that... I dead... said I've had enough, Dave. You need to lay hands on me. I'm going. But don't think you're not going to regret this. I'm taking the advertisement for my store out of your paper. You can take your advertisement. And I'll tell you what else I'm doing. I'm going to see to it that my Muriel never sees your son again. And that's just fine with me, because I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to see to it that Richard never sees Muriel again. Richard? Muriel? Muriel! What is it, Father? Come in here. What's the matter, Pa? Plenty is the matter. I want you to write a letter. Doesn't want my advertisement, eh? Well, who do you want me to write a letter to, Pa? To Richard Miller. Dick? I want you to tell that young scoundrel that you're never going to see him again. Father! No one's going to call me a darn fool... You write as I say. But, but I don't have a pen. Well, use my pen. Mr. Richard Miller. I'll die, Paul. I'll die if I never see him again. It'll take more than the absence of Richard Miller to separate you from this earth. Mr. Richard Miller. Dear Dick. Mr. Richard Miller. Mr. Richard Miller. Here I am, Pa. 
I thought I told you young man to come back as soon as McCumber left. Didn't you hear me call? Where have you been hiding? I wasn't hiding, Pa. I... I was... Well, Mildred was making such a racket with the firecrackers, I just didn't hear you, Pa. It uh, wouldn't be that you heard what Mr. McCumber and I were talking about, would it? Well, I... He... I see you did. Now, Richard, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want a straight answer. Yes, sir. And I warn you beforehand, Richard, that if the answer is yes, I'm going to punish you and punish you hard. Because you'll have done something no boy of mine ought to do. But I don't believe, even to save yourself punishment, you'd lie to me. I won't lie, Pa. Now, Richard, have you been... <clears throat> Dave McCumber said... Richard, have you been behaving toward Muriel in a way that you shouldn't? What do you mean, Pa? No! Well, what do you think I am, Pa? I, I never would. Why, I, I love her. I'm going to marry her after I get out of college. She said she would. We're engaged. All right. That's all I wanted to know. I don't see how you could think... Did that old idiot McCumber say that about me? <laughs> Shouldn't call your future father in law names, Dick. It ain't respectful. But you can't exactly blame old Dave, son, when you read through the stuff that you wished on his innocent daughter. What stuff? This. Oh, he found him, did he? Mm-hmm. Well, it'll do him good to read the truth about life for once and get rid of his old, foggy ideas. Well, now, right there, Richard, I'm afraid I have to agree with him. This kind of literature is hardly fit reading for a young girl. It's not? No, it's not. It's all well enough, of course, in this way for you, who are a man. I see your point, Pa. Oh, I only did it because I liked them. And I wanted her to face life as it is. She's so darn afraid of life, Pa. Afraid of this, afraid of that. Why, she's even afraid to let me kiss her. Mm, yes. I thought maybe reading those things... Well, they're giving her courage, Pa. They're giving her the spunk to lead her own life. After all, Pa, anybody who's going to marry me, they need courage, don't they? I'm afraid they do, Richard. I'm very much afraid they do. up, everybody. Lily, Sid, Essie. Come on now. I've got the auto started. Now get Lily, in now. first, Essie. All right, dear. Button up your dust a little. You like it? It's new. Richard! Where's Richard? Here I am, Ma. You sure you don't want to come along, Richard? It's a nice drive to the lighthouse and back. Well, thanks just the same, Pa. Driving to the lighthouse on the 4th of July may be a source of great excitement to the women. But personally, I think the whole business is very naive. Is that so? Yes, sir. Personally, I think the driving hey, somewhere... Just... Richard! We're right here, Mildred. What are you bellowing about? Yes, what are you bellowing about? Oh, shut up, Dick. Here's a letter for you. For me? What, mail on the 4th of July? A little boy brought it. Said it's from old man McCumber. Oh, what would Mr. McCumber be writing to me for? Why don't you open it and see? Oh, you mind your business. Uh, Richard, uh, maybe you better be prepared for a bit of a blow. Oh, a blow? Mm, if the letter says what I think it does. But never mind, son. There are a lot of other fish in the sea. Coming along, Mildred? Richard Miller, oh, I, I never wish to speak to you again. I would prefer that you... Oh, 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 me to reach me very truly yours, Muriel McCumber. The little coward. I hate her. I hate her. She can't treat me like that. I'll show her. <laughs> Gosh, I... I think I... My stomach's sick. Oh, darn Mildred and her darn firecrackers. You can't get any peace around here with that darn kid around. Darn the 4th of July anyway. I wish we still belonged to England. Who's there? Hey, Art. That you on the porch, Arthur? It's me, Dick. Oh, hi, Wynn. Hi. How does it feel being home after a year at Yale? You know, Arthur was telling me about you and him having one heck of a... Shh, keep it quiet, kid. Well, there's nobody can hear us. The whole family's gone off in my dad's automobile. Where's your brother? Arthur? Oh, he's out with Ethel Rand. 
Won't be home till about ten at least. Oh, fine. Just dandy. What's the matter, Wint? Can I help? Well, can you keep your face shut? Oh, sure I can, Wint. Well, listen, I ran into a couple of girls Art and I met in uh, New Haven. Oh, what are they doing here? Oh, they're visiting or something. Anyway, I dated them up for tonight. Both of them? Well, I thought I could catch Art. Now I'll have to pass them up. I'm, I'm nearly broke and I can't afford to blow them both to drinks. Well, I've got $11 saved up, Wint. I could loan you some. Say, you're a good sport. No, 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 Nick's kid. I don't want to borrow your money. Hey, have you got anything on for tonight? Well, no. Want to come along with me? No, I'm not trying to get you into anything, kid. All you have to do is just sit with Belle while I'm dancing with Edith. Hey, you won't have to do anything. Not even take a glass of beer unless you want to. Oh, what do you think I am? A rube? You mean you're game, kid, for anything that's doing? Sure I am. Ever been out with any girls? Oh, sure I have. Ever drink anything besides sodas? Sure, lots of times. Uh, beer and slow gin fizz and, and Manhattans. Say, you know more than I thought. Can you fix it so you can be at the Pleasant Beach House tonight at half past nine? Sharp? Sure, that's easy. It's all set? All set. So long, kid. See you at the Pleasant Beach House. Half past nine. Sharp. So long, Wynn. I'll show her. I'll show her she can't treat me the way she's done. I'll show them all. I can predict with a great deal of confidence that in Act Two, shortly to follow, Richard will indeed show them all. There are fireworks ahead. Speaking for the Ford Motor Company now, Kenneth Banghart. If you set out to visit every community in the United States, you'd be traveling for a long time and you'd see a great many unfamiliar things. But in almost every community, you would see at least one familiar thing. The sign of a Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer. And it wouldn't surprise you at all, because there's been a Ford dealer in nearly every part of America for at least 35 years now. You expect to see one wherever you go. But have you ever stopped to think of what it takes to be a Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer? Probably not, although there are very definite requirements, and they're important to you. Before a man can obtain a Ford or a Lincoln Mercury dealership, he has to meet a number of requirements. He has to show the Ford Motor Company that he's a responsible citizen, well regarded in his community. He has to demonstrate that he's able and intelligent, capable of managing a sound business. He must have a spirit of responsibility to his customers and his community. And he has to be able to gather together a considerable amount of money for buildings, tools, equipment, parts, and employees' wages. The average investment today in Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealerships all over the country is many thousands of dollars. These requirements have to be met not only to obtain a dealership, but also to keep it. A dealer must continue to run his business with completely adequate facilities, efficient management, sound finances, and proper spirit. These things mean better service for you. They mean that wherever you go, you'll find a dealer qualified and equipped to serve you right. And they mean he'll be anxious to serve you. The more than 7,000 independent businessmen who are your Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealers know that their success depends on pleasing you, their investment, their future, Their jobs and their employees' jobs, their whole business, depends on making you a satisfied customer. And they know that very well. It's just common sense. Good service is good business. That's why you'll get good service when you go to your Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer. The second act of the Ford Theater production of Our Wilderness will continue after a brief pause for station identification. The Ford Theater, Our Wilderness, Act the Second. And we're back in the year 1906. It's 11 hours later, 11 hours since Muriel's letter reached Richard, informing him that all is o'er between them. We find Richard now in the back room of a small and clearly disreputable hotel. The dingy room is lighted by two fly-specked globes in two fly-specked wall brackets, 
set into the hideous, saffron-colored, fly-specked wallpaper. Here, beside the door marked Family Entrance, blares a nickel-in-the-slot player piano. And here, sitting beside a beer-stained table, is Richard, forgetting it all with a lady known as Belle. <laughs> Aren't we having a nice time, Richard? Aren't we having a wonderful time? Sure, Belle. Oh, come on. Say it like you mean it. Now, you say, I'm having a wonderful time, Belle. Uh, I'm having a wonderful time, Belle. Well, then drink up your beer, why don't you? It's getting flat. Oh, I let it get that way on purpose. I I like it better when it's flat. <laughs> You're a scream, kid. Isn't he, George? Yeah. Bartenders are always called George. Yeah, he's a scream, all right. He's also a spender. My head's dizzy bringing you in drinks. Ah, oh, don't let him kid you, Dick. You show him. Loosen up and buy another drink. What do you say? Huh? Oh, sure. Excuse me. I, I was thinking of something else. See what the lady will have and have one on me yourself, George. That's talking. Didn't I say you were a sport? I'll take a cigar on you. What's yours, kiddo? The same? Yeah. Make it a real one, will you? <laughs> I'll try, seeing it's you. What's yours? Another beer? Uh, a small one, please. I'm not thirsty. Say, honest, kid, are things that slow around here? Filling up on beer will only make you sleepy. Come on, have a man's drink. All right. I, I was going to anyway. Bring me a, a slow gin fizz. And make it good. You know what I mean? Something that'll warm him up, huh? Hmm. Sure, I get you. Hey, anybody around? How about some service out here? Yeah, come on, come on. You know something? You're a very sweet kid. You're a very sweet kid. I think I could like you a lot. Uh, say, where did Wink go with your girlfriend? Out on the porch, holding hands. Oh. Why don't you hold my hand, Dickie boy? Don't you like me? Well, sure I like you. Only... Only what? Well, it's only that I've got a, a weight on my mind. You have? Well, here, have a cigarette. That'll take it off. You smoke, don't you? What? Oh, oh, oh sure I do. Yeah, yeah, I've been smoking for years. Only I... At the moment, I... I don't happen to care for the weed. Well, suit yourself. Mmm... This is more like it. Say, you know you oughtn't to inhale like that. Smoking's awful bad for girls. <laughs> Gee, kid, you're a scream. You'll grow up to be a minister yet. Look, Richard. Yes, Belle? Why do you want to be so unfriendly for? I'm not unfriendly. Why don't you put your arms around me, then? <sighs> oh, no, not that dead way. Hold me tight. I think you just don't like me. I do, too, like you. Then why don't you kiss me? You call that kissing? Here. <laughs> <laughs> the matter, honey boy? Haven't you ever been kissed like that before? <laughs> uh, sure. Lots of times. Only I... I've sworn off. Sworn off kissing? I took an oath I'd be faithful. I've heard everything now. Ready for the drinks, Belle? Oh. Fix them up the way you said. Man, how I'm ready. Oh, come on, kid. At least show me you know how to drink. Bottoms up. All right. That's the way. Bottoms up. Another the same, George. Yeah, right. Nothing else to do. May as well drink. <coughs> hey, doesn't anybody live in this town? What do you do here? Pull in the streets at nine? Pull in the streets and roll up the sidewalks. What's your line? China wear. And if you're asking how's business, it's on ice. <laughs> Folks don't even eat around here. Um, there's something in the back room that might interest you. What's that? Swell little number. Take a tip. I think she's about ready for reinforcement. Well, she's got company, don't she? Ah, dumb kid. I think she'd welcome a change. Well, maybe I ought to look into this. <laughs> Give us another shot, will you? Yeah, sure. And then tell Goldilocks to get ready for the great big bear. <laughs> But I wouldn't do such because I loved her too much. 
But I've learned about women from her. Huh. Let's have another drink. You've had enough. You know, you're a nice girl, Belle. A very nice girl. But you, you oughtn't to leave this kind of life. Why don't you reform? Reform? Now, look here, I'm getting good sick evening, of you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Oh. Hope I'm not butting in on your party back here, but my dogs were giving out standing at the bar. All right with me. <laughs> I got no party in. Oh, ho, they cried. The world is wide. Hey, what is it, a child uh, poet or a child actor? I don't the know. It's got me wide. guessing. Well, look, if you can shake the cradle uh, off an act. All I do is pull my freight. Uh, listen, kid, here's an old friend of mine, uh, Mr. Smith from New Haven. Huh? He just come in and I want to talk to him, see? Uh, say, you better go home. I'm never going home. I'll show them. Well, have it your own way. Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Smith. What kind of beer are you drinking, sister? Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each... I did it with a kiss. I'm a coward. Oh, he's copped a fine skin for... Gee, he's hardly had anything. Oh, this gal of yours don't appreciate poetry, Sonny. But I'm the kid that eats it up. Come on, give us some more of the same. I don't believe you ever knew this lady in New Haven at all. You just picked her up now. That's what she did. You leave her alone, do you hear me? Listen to it, will you? This is going to be good. Curse you, Jack Dalton. If I won't unhand her, what then? I'll give you a good punch in the snoot, that's why. <laughs> help! 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 Hey, hey, what's going on in here? He's going to murder me! Uh, he's <laughs> too dark and fresh. Well, cut out the noise here. All of you. Uh, George. Uh, none of my business, George, but if I were in your boots, uh, <clears throat> he's underage, George. He told me he was over 18. And I tell you, I'm Teddy Roosevelt. Now, if you're not looking for trouble... Yeah. All right, son. On your way. Beat it. I will not beat it. I'll give him the bums rush, George. Let go of me, you dirty coward. Quiet now, or I'll pin a Marianne on your jaw that'll quiet you. Oh, you want to fight, do you? All right, come on. Come on, I'm game. Oh! Come on, fight. He's breaking up the furniture. Yeah, that's what I'll do to you, Why, too. you look... You want to get tough, do you? All right. Come on, a fight. I'll fight any man in this room. Come on and fight. Something's happened to him, Nat. I just know something terrible's happened. Nothing's happened to him, Messy. I'm telling you he'll be home any minute. There's nothing to worry about. <sighs> What time is it now, Nat? It's, uh... Eleven o'clock. Well, eleven o'clock's not so late, S.C. Not on the Fourth of July. Richard, come home yet? Uh, not yet, Sid. I was just trying to tell her, Sid, nobody but a bunch of old fogies would be home before eleven on the Fourth of if July. If you don't stop talking Fourth of July... There he is now. Do you see? I told you, S.C. There wasn't a thing to worry about. Greetings, all. The prodigal son is back. Oh, it's you, Arthur. Oh, we thought it was Richard. Isn't he home... Say, he oughtn't to be allowed out this late at his age. What, when I was his age... We know all I, about that, Arthur. He's right. He's right. You don't know what might have happened to him. You read in the papers every day about boys getting run over by automobiles. Why don't you do something? Why don't you go out and find him? Well, I was going to go out and look anyway if he wasn't back by 12 sharp, but if it leaves your mind... Now, that's him. I know that's him. It falls like him. Richard? Oh, oh thank heaven. Well, darn him. I'll give him the devil for worrying us like this. Richard! Everybody. Richard. Oh, my goodness, what's happened to him, Nat? He's gone crazy. <laughs> crazy nothing. <laughs> He's soused. Drink, for you know not whence you come, nor why. Drink. Richard, how dare you? Don't you strike him, Nat. Steady now, Nat. The boy don't know what he's doing. And then, at ten o'clock... Eiler Loveborg will come <laughs> with vine leaves in his hair. <laughs> Richard, you're intoxicated, you bad, wicked boy, you. He's a mess. Oh, me? Why, I... 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 Oh, my... I feel rotten, Dick. My baby. Let me uh, handle this, Essie. Uh, all right now, boy. You'll be all right now. Dad, he's sick. Uh, you let me take care of this, Essie. Uh, I know this game backwards. Darn 
dare see I ought to be back at the office. Now, if he doesn't come down in a few minutes... Now, you're not going back without seeing him, Nat Miller. Well, of course I'm not. Good heavens, what do you think I came all the way home from the office for in the middle of the day? To give him a piece of your mind. You are the symbol of the morning after, Nat. Thanks, Sid, for the kind words. Now, Essie, I'm perfectly willing to talk to Richard, but I can't if he isn't here. Now, where is he? Well, he's still in bed. Still in bed? I made him stay in bed to punish him. I thought he ought to anyway after being so sick. He'll be all right, Essie. I remember when I was his age, I If could... I was in your shoes, Sid, I'd keep still. His own uncle, no wonder. <laughs> Richard must be feeling better, though, Nat. He ate all the dinner I took up. I thought you weren't going to give him any dinner to punish him. Well, in his weakened condition, I thought it best. But I've given him pieces of my mind he won't forget. I've kept reminding him his real punishment was still to come, and that he'd learn you can be terrible stern when you want to. Yes. Mm. Shall I go now and tell him to get dressed? You want to see him? Well, yes, I can't waste all day here. Now, you keep your temper, Nat. Remember. Hey, Sid. This is serious, Sid. Huh? What? This is a lot more serious than Essie has any idea. What do you mean, Nat? What do you mean, uh, more serious? There, uh, was a girl mixed up with Richard Spree last night. How do you know? There was a man up at the Pleasant Beach house there, same time Richard was there, salesman. Uh, Richard was at the Pleasant Beach house? Yes, that's where he was, Sid, and this salesman knows a man who knows one of the men at the plant, and he told him. Well, this is serious, Nat, with a boy like Dick, especially. Oh, darn it. I've got to have a straight talk with him about women and such. I ought to have a long time ago. <laughs> yes, you ought, Nat. Well, I tried to, Sid, a couple of times, but, heck, I always sort of get, uh... I can't ever seem to get started right. Well, here comes the bad man, I guess. Well, now's the time to talk, Nat, and you better tell him, you know, uh, what's what. Mm -hmm. Guess I better. I'm sorry, Nat, but he was sound asleep, and I didn't have the heart to wake him. Well, I'll now, be... don't you lose your temper, Nat Miller. You know, as well as I do, he needs all the sleep he can get after last night. Do you want him to be taken down sick? Well, I'll be eternally... You certainly take the cake, Essie. Bring a man all the way home on a busy day. I'm going back to the office where things make sense. But I'm coming home to supper, Essie Miller. And when I do, I want that boy downstairs and waiting. And what I'll have to tell him will blister the horns off the devil himself. <laughs> Intermission, while Richard sleeps and the household worries. For the Ford Motor Company, once more, Kenneth Banghart. When you want to have something done for your Ford, no matter what it is, take it to your Ford dealer. That's only logical because your Ford dealer knows your Ford best. Fords are his business. He knows how to care for them. And what's more, he's prepared and equipped to give you the best service. If you visit the service department of your Ford dealer, you'll notice that he has much special Ford equipment. Tools and machines designed especially for use on Ford cars. You'll see equipment like the diagnosis test set, an ignition stroboscope, a complete electrical laboratory on wheels designed to detect causes of car troubles quickly and accurately. Or you may see equipment that uses a photoelectric cell to measure the brightness of headlights or a special Ford wheel aligning equipment. In all, there are about 200 pieces of special equipment and tools which Ford service engineers have helped design so that your Ford will get better and quicker service. You'll notice that your dealer has genuine Ford parts and Ford-approved accessories, too. That means that the replacements you buy will be built to Ford specifications, made right to fit right, and last longer. And you'll find that your dealer's mechanics are Ford-trained, that they know the factory-approved methods of servicing your car, methods worked out by the men who planned and made your Ford. These are ways in which your Ford dealer is prepared to serve you better, better. He can give you this fine service, and he will, because he values your business. The same thing goes for Lincoln Mercury dealers. They are prepared to give you the best service on your Mercury or Lincoln. They also have special equipment, specially trained mechanics, and genuine parts. And they also are anxious to serve you. Next time, go to the man who knows your car best your Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer. He'll make you a satisfied customer if you give him the chance. Our radio version of Our Wilderness has been constructed
constructed with loving care by Sylvia Cyril, one of a group of veteran radio writers working with the management of the Ford Theater to bring to the air all types of dramatic entertainment. For the benefit of newcomers to this playhouse, I'd like to stress that word all once more. In the weeks ahead, you will find here radio versions of movies, stage plays, novels, and operettas, as well as revivals of past radio successes and new plays commissioned to be written especially for radio and the Ford Theater. Next week, for example, we shall present our first Ford original. Critics of radio have complained that the broadcast medium has produced few dramatic writers of important stature during its 25 years of existence. The management of the Ford Theater has attempted, by offering high rewards in both money and prestige, to encourage original work of high caliber aimed directly at radio production. The first result is next week's play, The Power and the Glory, by Hector Chevigny. The Power and the Glory is a serious drama about politics and prejudice, involving a conflict between political pressure and academic freedom in the medical school of an American state university. Be sure to listen to Mr. Chevigny's play next Sunday. And I believe our curtain is about to rise now on the third act of Our Wilderness. The morning after 16-year-old Richard Miller tried to forget his broken heart at the Pleasant Beach House has dropped into a hot July afternoon. But the culprit has not yet made his appearance. Now it is three o'clock in the afternoon and Richard's Uncle Sid and Uncle Sid's fiancée, Lily, are sitting on the porch of the Miller home. Pretty hot evening on the porch here, isn't it, Lily? Want me to go get your fan? No. No, thanks, Sid. I don't have the heart to feel the weather today. Oh, now listen, Lily. You're not sitting here worrying I about... I certainly am. I'm a 16-year-old boy. Well, jump into your house, I've had you almost worse than Essie. You don't think Richard would turn into a... to a... I don't know what I think anymore, Sid. What do you mean? Here comes Arthur. Hello, Lily. Hello, Hi, Arthur. Sid. Oh, Arthur. Isn't it a scorcher? Say, I'll bet it's the hottest July 5th in the history of this town. Uh, Richard come down yet? No, not yet, Arthur. Good gosh, it's 3 o'clock. How long is he going to hide out? Guess he's waiting until the fireworks die down. Well, they won't, Uncle Sid. I, I guarantee that. Why, if I'd done what he did when I was his age, I doubt if I'd be in Yale today. The effect on Yale would be too horrible to contemplate. Uh, what's that, Uncle Sid? It's Richard. Well, the bad man himself. <laughs> How's my fellow rum pot? Oh, let's not go into that, Uncle Sid. Hello, Lily. Hello. Boy, you sure were a mess last night. What's it to you? Mm, nothing at all. Except that as the head of this family, uh, after Dad, and as the man whose footsteps you're supposed to be following into Yale next year... Oh, I... Yale. What's so great about Yale? All you do is talk about Yale. Well, you'll find out what's so great about Yale. Arthur... Will you go next door and get me my fan, please? You'll find it somewhere on the buffet. All right. But I know Pa's going to have something to say about this when he gets home, and it won't be funny. You, um, you gave the family quite a turn last night, Dick. Good grief. What's everybody so excited about? Well, now, maybe I'm the last man in the world who's got a right to talk, Richard. I guess I am, but what you did last night... Uh... I was desperate, Uncle Sid. Even if she wasn't worth it. I was wounded to the heart. Yeah, well, I like to the quick better myself. It's more stylish. However, This I... is no laughing matter, Sid. Well, Lily, I didn't say it was a laughing matter. You've got I... to stop, Richard, before it's too late. Well, stop what? Even if you won't think of yourself, Richard. Even if you won't think of the disgrace you'll be bringing on your innocent family, think of Muriel. Muriel? Oh, Lily. You'll break her heart, Richard, and you won't know it till it's too late. You don't know, Richard. You don't know the shame and agony of being in love with a drinking man. Lily... Day it... after day, you keep telling yourself you'll change. You'll be different now. But he's not, Richard. He never is. And all that happens is that you get older and older, and one day you wake up and you... 
She's got nothing. She's all alone, and her best friend is saying, poor old Muriel, still waiting at her age. Oh, where's Arthur with that friend? Oh, gosh, what's she talking about? Do you know, Uncle Sid? I think I can guess, Dick. Dick! Hey, Richard! Oh, here I am. For Pete's sake, what do you always have to be yelling for? What's everybody looking so gloomy about? Something happened? What'd you want Dick for, Mildred? I have another letter for him. I was passing by Muriel McCumber's house. Oh, Muriel? Let me have it. Well, don't grab. Honestly, he gets crazier and crazier every day. Uncle Sid. What's the matter, Dick? You're not going to be sick again, are you? She's going to see me, Uncle Sid. At nine o'clock tonight, she... She's going to see me. <laughs> Now, did she write nine or ten? Hmm, nine, all right. Oh, darn it, I wish she'd show up. I'll have to memorize a new poem for her. Recite it to her next time. Oh, there's nine now. She couldn't get away. She was caught. Oh, gee, I sure hate to go home without having seen her. Oh, who ever heard of a woman being on time? I ought to know enough about life by this time to... There she is. Oh, gosh. And lo, my love, mine own soul's heart. I mustn't let her know I'm so tickled. If women are too sure of you, they treat you like slaves. Hello, dear. Oh, uh, hello. Is it nine already? I bet you've forgotten I was even coming. Oh, no, no, no. I hadn't forgotten. But, um, I got to thinking about life. Well, you might think of me for a change, Dick Mill. After all the risks I've run making this date and sneaking out, you didn't take the trouble to sneak any letter to me, I noticed. No, because after your first letter, I thought everything was dead and passed between us. And I'll bet you didn't care one little bit. Oh, I was a fool ever to come here. I've got a good notion to go right home and never speak to you again. No, don't go, Muriel, please. I didn't mean anything like that. Honest, I didn't. Gee... If you knew how broken-hearted I was by that first letter. I don't believe you. I swear. Oh, gosh, Muriel, you're pretty tonight. Can't I... Won't you let me kiss you now, please? No, you mustn't. No, why can't I? Aren't you ever going to let me? I will. Sometime. When? Soon. Maybe. Tonight, will you? I'll see. Promise? I promise. Maybe. All right. You remember you promised. Oh, Dick, you have no idea what I went through to get here tonight. And you don't realize what I've been through for you. And what I did last night. What your letter made me do. What did my letter make you do? Never mind. Let the dead past bury its dead. Oh, you just have to tell me, Dick. Well, after your old man... Uh, after your father left our place, I caught the deuce from Pa. <gasps> Dick, you mustn't swear. Well, that's the only way I can describe my feelings. And on top of that, I got your letter. Oh, Pa made me write it, Dick. He stood right over me and told me each word to write. I thought your love for me was dead. So I said to myself, what difference does it make now what I do? I may as well forget her and lead the pace that kills. You know, I had $11 saved up, but I thought, she's dead to me now and why shouldn't I throw it away? Oh, well, I've still got almost five left, Muriel. But, but tell me what you did. Well, after it was dark, I sneaked out and went to a low dive I know about. Dick Miller, I don't believe you ever did. Oh, you asked them at the Pleasant Beach House if I didn't. They won't forget me in a hurry. Why, that's a terrible place. Well, I said it was a dive, didn't I? There wasn't anyone there but a Princeton senior I know. And he had two chorus girls from New York with him. And they were all drinking champagne. Dick Miller, I hope you didn't notice... Oh, I, I noticed one of the girls. The one that wasn't with him. She was looking at me. She had strange-looking eyes. And then she asked me if I wouldn't drink champagne with them and, and come and sit with her. Hmm. She must have been a nice thing. Her name was Belle. She had golden hair. 
The kind that burns and stings you. And she kept smoking one cigarette after another. Oh, but that's nothing for a chorus girl. She was low and bad. And then what happened? Oh, we just kept drinking champagne. And uh, then I had a fight with the barkeep and knocked him down because he insulted her. Why did you fight for her? Why didn't that Princeton scene? Oh, he was too drunk by that time. And were you drunk? Uh, only a little then. Oh, I was worse later. Boy, you ought to have seen me when I got home. I was on the verge of delirium treatments. I'm glad I didn't see you. I hate people who get drunk. I'd have hated you. What happened with that... Bell? After... Before you went home? Oh, we kept drinking champagne and, uh, She kissed me. Oh. Oh, but it was only all in fun. And did you kiss her? No, I didn't. You did, too. You're lying. You know it. And here I was wondering how I was ever going to see you again and crying my eyes out while you... Oh, I hate you. I wish you were dead. I never want to lay eyes on you again, and this time I mean it. Goodbye. Muriel. Forever. Muriel, wait. Listen. Oh, I'm ruined. Well, darn it, Essie, I haven't finished reading the paper. Can't I sit inside? Why do I have to wait on the porch? Because, Nat Miller, I don't want you to miss Richard again. You've been promising me you'd talk to him all day now. Well, good grief, I tried to, didn't I? I came home from the office just to talk, didn't I? Now, where was he at supper? Well, he ran off to meet Muriel. Mildred brought another letter. I'm beginning to think that girl should never have learned to write. Oh, here he is now, coming up the walk. Now, Nat, you can't get out of it this time. It's for his own sake. Say, he doesn't look too chipper, does he? He does look odd again. Matt, you don't suppose he's been... No. It's love, not liquor this time. You better leave us alone for a while, Essie. I'll wait inside. Call me if you want me. Evening, Richard. Evening, Mark. Well, young man. Oh, Pa. I, I didn't see you sitting there. How the vine leaves in your hair tonight. Turned out to be poison ivy, didn't they? I know, Pa. Now, Richard, I'm not going to read you any temperance lecture because in spite of your foolishness last night, I'm still giving you credit for having brains. I know I was a fool, Pa. Not only a fool, but a downright stupid, disgusting fool. It was bad enough to let me and your Uncle Sid see you, but to appear like that before your mother... I know, Pa. Now, um... What about that girl at the Pleasant Beach House? Belle? Well, how did you know about Belle, Pa? I was shocked, Richard, I don't mind saying. I know, Pa. In my day, a man didn't uh, kiss a girl he wasn't practically engaged to. I know, Pa. Richard? Yes, Pa? Richard, it's about time you and I had a serious talk. Yes, Pa. There are certain things... Uh, pertaining to certain matters that pertain... To... Yes, Pa? <clears throat> well, now that the subject's come up of its own accord, it's a good time. I, I mean, there's no use in procrastinating further, so here goes. <clears throat> Richard? Yes, Pa? Richard, you've now come to the age when... Uh, and it's only natural for you to have certain... Uh... I mean, here's what I'm driving at, Richard. Richard? I mean, your whole life might be ruined if, uh... So, darn it, you've got to know that. I, I mean, uh... Well, now that we've talked it all over, Richard, do you have any questions? I do, Pa. One. Oh, you do, huh? Uh, well, what is it? How do you make a girl forgive you? Muriel's sore at me. How do you... Oh, how do you... Well... You act like a man, Richard. You go to her and you tell her that you made a mistake. Frankly and honestly. You tell her you were wrong and you're sorry. And I think maybe she'll forgive you. Well, gee, Pa, thanks. I'll go right over. Gee, that makes everything all right, doesn't it? I guess it does, son. It's all right now, Essie. Come on out. Everything's going to be all right. Tell me that. Oh, I'd better hurry, Pa. I... Gosh. You do know about some things, don't you, Pa? Not many, son, but I try. Why, son? You're a man, Pa. Good night. Good night, Ma. Good night, son. 
it's a lovely night, isn't it, Matt? The moon's way down low, almost setting. You saw what he did, Essie? You saw what Richard did? Yes, Nat. He kissed you. I don't believe in kissing between fathers and sons after a certain age, as he seems mushy and silly. But at a time like this... Well, th- that meant something, didn't it, Essie? Yes, it did, Nat. I guess no matter what life will do to him now, he can take care of it. Can't he, Essie? Yes, Nat. Gonna turn out the lights. Already? Let her go, Gallagher. There he goes. Like love's young dream. Say, what is it that Rubaiyat says? Yet, ah, that spring should vanish with a rose, that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close. Well, spring isn't everything, is it, Essie? There's a lot to be said for autumn. Autumn's got beauty, too. And winter, if you're together. Yes, Ned. It certainly is. Next week, an event of considerable importance in the progress of broadcast drama. Hector Chevigny's Ford Theater original, The Power and the Glory. Our Wilderness was adapted by Sylvia Ciro, edited by Howard Teichman, with continuity by George Faulkner. The musical score was written and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. Richard Miller was played by Raymond Ives, Nat Miller by Eric Dressler, Mrs. Miller by Ann Seymour, and Muriel McCumber by Rosemary Rice. The other players were Alan Bunce, Frank Dane, Elsie Hitz, Evelyn Juster, Lorna Lynn, James McCallion, Edgar Staley, Frank Thomas, and Chuck Webster. All right, that was Eugene O'Neill's Ah Wilderness, presented by the Ford Theater. And, uh, Jake, any success talking to the landlord there? I spoke with him. I asked him to fix the AC, and okay. he asked me how I would mm-hmm. feel if he upped our rent. So I don't think we're going to get the AC fixed anytime soon. Be, uh, what was that? I don't think we're getting the AC fixed anytime soon. He made it pretty clear that working AC means more, more money every month. So. Oh, okay. I mean... I guess when you put it into that terms. All right, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, the last thing we have to present to you today. So, I'm sure a lot of you know who Bob and Ray are. If you don't, if you don't, they were a comedy team. They started out working at, I think it was WHDH. W, yeah, WHDH. It was uh, just like this local radio station. And in the 40s, they were just supposed to uh, do a little pre show banter before baseball games were aired. So, they were like, they're just doing this filler show. Uh, and they and it sort of became this 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 like ad libbing weird creature of a thing they created. Bob and Ray just goofing around behind the microphone. I I really like those early episodes. They're not for everybody, but they remind me a lot of the kind of stuff uh, McLean and I and our friends used to do uh, when we were on uh, local radio stations. Um, Anyway, that's kind of how Bob and Ray started out, but they became a comedy duo. Uh, sometimes they were ad-libbing stuff, sometimes it was scripted. Uh, they did a lot of lot of voices, parodies of things. Uh, very much sort of in that Stan Freeberg vein, uh, maybe a little more relaxed. Um, now, here's the thing. When it comes to collecting episodes of the various radio shows they had, and they had a lot of different shows and time slots on different networks, when it comes to collecting them, the audio quality of episodes you can find, not very good. Now... The, I think the official, I don't know if it states the right word, the people that manage the Bob and Ray stuff, they put out a bunch of sets, and I, I own them, they put out a bunch of sets of Bob and Ray material, but it's all in clips. They didn't put out, like, whole episodes, which I, <laughs> I really just like that. I'll just say that. But this is a, this is an assortment of clips from a couple of episodes of the Bob and Ray show. Some of them are from, uh, 1959. I'm not sure the year or the other ones, but I think they're from roughly the same... 
year, I think. I'm not entirely sure. But, yeah, this is uh, just some various Bob and Ray material. From a beautiful Pine Grove State Park in Smolin, New York, this is Radio's Wally Baloo welcoming you to the annual Bob and Ray Employees Outing at the Clam Bay. It's a beautiful day here during the next quarter hour. My broadcasting complete partner, Artie Skirmahorn, and I will try to bring you some of the color and some of the... Going on here at uh, no, uh, Pine Grove. Just a minute, please. No. Uh, Bob and Ray are due to arrive at any minute. They haven't uh, haven't made their appearance as yet. We're speaking to you from the improvised stage here at the edge of the picnic crowds. The smell of the pit in which the fire is being built to cook the clams uh, is wafting across this group of some 60 or 70 employees of Bob and Ray. The music you've listened to for the past few minutes has been supplied by oh, Claude and Clyde, the McBeady so. twins of their orchestra, and I'd like to have you say Quiet. just a word uh, Quiet, uh, to the maestros. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, we hope we you hope enjoyed, you enjoyed our, music. our music, and, and uh, we, uh, know we know it's always a pleasure, pleasure to, uh, to uh, meet and mingle, mingle with, uh, with uh, all, all the great Bob and Ray employees. Hope you enjoy the music, and... So long for now. now. I love their music. And as they make their way back to the bandstand, we see no sign as yet. What's that? Bob and Ray. Where? Wally, could I interrupt you just a second? Artie Skirmahog, come in, please. Uh, I think, uh, Wally, that uh, there's a hog calling contest coming to a conclusion over here at the far end of the Pine Grove area. Uh, It seems to me that a group of Madison Avenue uh, hog fanciers uh, have come up here for a hog calling contest. Uh, They were only supposed to have the park for this morning. That's right. They were supposed to be out of here by noon. That's right. Well, maybe someone can... uh... Webley Webster, I wonder if you could go over and see if you could shoe them off a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll see what I can do. Anyway. I'll help you. Right uh, here, Artie, I wonder if you'd give me a hand uh, on our commercial for today's program. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're working under field conditions. It's a little bit difficult, but we will try to uh, include all of the elements of the Bob and Ray show until they arrive. I mean, it's hot. Uh, okay, then, uh, uh, Wally, uh, Artie Scrimahorn here. I might like to mention right now the Columbia Portable Phonograph. Now, you can carry the fun with you with a Columbia Stereophonic High Fidelity Portable Phonograph. I noticed uh, today that Clyde L. Half Wartney uh, brought up his uh, portable phonograph, and he's having a wonderful time over there under a tree. Well, anyone who has a Columbia (laughs) Stereophonic Portable Phonograph will have all of the fun of the best of music, the wonderful world of sound, with them wherever they go. And the prices are reasonable, too. They begin at only $24.95 for Columbia Portables. Uh, excuse me. Go well, ahead, Artie. Right. I just wanted to mention that they have that big console sound reproduced by Columbia Stereophonic High Fidelity Phonographs. So thrill to the excitement of Stereo One by Columbia. Number one in the wonderful world of sound. See them at your Columbia dealer today. Thanks, Artie Skirbahorn. And now, I see at the edge of the picnic grounds the Bob and Ray chauffeur driver. High-powered air conditioning limousine. Bob and Ray, come on. Trying to get the word is getting around. Bob and Ray, come on. Bob and Ray. Employees, rather. And Bob and Ray, wave that. Oh, play the regal music with BB's. Man, change the pit. Bye, Bob and Ray are waving as they drive slowly through, wending their way amongst the pine trees. Yeah, and a generous round of applause. Hey, I imagine to keep in the air-conditioned comfort which they've, they've driven up here in. And right here, before we hear from Bob and Ray, who incidentally don't seem to be getting out of the limousine at this point, they must be making last-minute plans for their what they will say. Uh, excuse in their... me, Wally. Yes, uh, I might mention uh, I was just trying to uh, talk uh, with the McBeaties here, estimating the temperature. Uh, I'd say that it was maybe 102 degrees here today with high humidity, uh, maybe uh, 98% or so. And, uh, and I think that... Uh, 
It's uh, the reason Bob and Ray are not getting out of their black uh, limousine is that it's an air-conditioned car. I think they're going to stay you in there. think they'll stay there for the whole show? I is that so. the word that's going around? The mosquitoes are so thick, I don't blame them. Right now, for a bit of the sports activity taking place here at Pine Grove Park, let's switch to the baseball field and Steve Bosco to bring you the featured last half of the seventh inning. Hi, everybody. This is Steve Bosco, all set to bring you the last half of the featured seventh inning, $20 added here. The game between the fat Bob and Ray employees and the skinny Bob and Ray employees. Uh, Chester Hasbrook Frisbee of the fat team is at bat now. Uh, Jack Headstrong is the skinny pitcher. He's uh, tossing him up to Chester now. Seems to be a little delay. I might point out uh, an unfortunate incident that uh, happened earlier in the second inning when Charles the Port uh, slid into second base for what appeared to be a two-base hit. Uh, the only thing was he stirred up a bit of a ruckus. He slid into a pole cat uh, that was sleeping on the other side of the second base bag, and they had to bury his skinny uniform. Uh, he's finishing out the game in his swimming trucks. Uh, Dr. Brittany Stoll is on first. He was hit in the head uh, by a high heart one uh, just a moment ago, so he's taking a very short lead off first. Chester Hasbrook Frisbee uh, swinging uh, his bat at the plate. Jack Hitstrong uh, winds up, and there's the pitch. The slow roller going down to second base. And they should be an uh, easy double play ball. And well, uh, Robin Ray's the team has just come from uh, approximately the third base coach's line uh, up over the pitcher's mound. I think they probably nicked Jack Hitstrong and have uh, gone off to a shady spot in deep right field. Uh, I think that that probably will be the end of the ball game, the beach at seven. On this uh, happy note, I... Oh, it's a happy note. Yes, Jack Hitstrong is all right, and now they seem to be arguing down there that it was illegal that uh, Bob and Ray drove across the field, but it is their picnic. On this note, then, this is Steve Bosco rounding third, being thrown out at home. Back here at the entertainment uh, side of the uh, park, this is Wally Ballou again, and we're about to see some of the first of the acts lined up for today's fun. First of all, I'm going to call on my broadcasting uh, partner, Artie Skirmahorn, to help me describe the Cabot Brother and their flamenco dance. Artie? Well, uh, it uh, was billed as the Cabot Brothers. That's uh, what I thought. Fortunately, uh, Bruce uh, tripped and sprained his ankle in rehearsal, so it will be just Lenny. A hey, Cabot Brother. Just one. There he goes. He's on the stage now. I've never seen him uh, perform in quite this fashion before. Well, I... Uh, I uh, wouldn't like... It's almost as if he were staggering, Artie. Wouldn't you say I think so? exactly that's what he's doing. Uh, I... I wouldn't like to criticize of an act, but it appears to me that he's in bad shape. Get him off the stage. Somebody get Cyril Gore ready. He's going on early. Get that Cabot brother off before he hurts himself. The Cabot brother, uh, Flamenco dance act, has not gone over too Put well. Water on him. He'll be all right. But they're pouring water on him now. Coming up the steps to the stage now is one of the acts flown here from England. Go right on out, Cyril. Well, you need something to pep up the audience. A uh, great little talent, great little performer, Cyril Gore, flautist. And what are you going to give the folks, Cyril? It's too late. He's on the stage Oh, now. he's going into his number right now. There he goes. <laughs> Yes, I think we better get him off the stage before he... I don't think they'll stand much more of it. Cyril, you better get off the stage for your own good. We don't want too much trouble. Thank you very much. It's nice of you to come uh, this Artie far. Skirmahorn is escorting Mr. Gore to the rear of the platform now. Yeah, certainly. Well, and I think it would be a good time, ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, to bring on the wealthy Jacobus Pike, chairman of the Bob and Ray Board. Will you get him for me, Artie? Uh, he Mr. is Pike. going to deliver the Mr. prepared Pike, announcement that Bob and Ray would have given uh, had they not uh, stayed in their limousine. You come right over here, Mr. Pike. He has a few pages of prepared copy there. And in just a moment, we will hear the uh, speech that they would have delivered. You need a microphone, Mr. Pike? No, I can just speak right up. The Bob and Ray employees welcome to your annual company picnic. We hope you're having 
at Cracker Jack for a good time. Bob and Ray want me to extend to you their kindest regards and best wishes for the coming year. We hope that in the future years that this family of ours will grow and that we will all prosper and Hey, Pike, give it a break, will you? I... Oh, Bob and Ray, a couple of cheesecakes. Oh, just a moment here. Oh, there, sir. I don't oh, think they are. Not. That is a very Bob and Ray have don't driven here out of their way. Who asked them to come? To come here to grace your company picnic. I think the least you can do is be polite. Uh, food will be served in just a few moments. Thank you very much, Mr. Pike. Oh, I stand back and be quiet. Let the old man finish. I'm all through. I'm I believe through. he is finished, uh, Webley. And uh, very nice remarks, too, from uh, Jacobus Pike, uh, courtesy of uh, the two boys. It's a beautiful day here at Pine Grove uh, State Park in Spallen, New York. And we get back to the entertainment portion of our program before uh, turning to the uh, sandwiches and the clam bake. Wally, I think that uh, Tex Blaisdell, Bob and Ray's famous cowboy, is here with his dog act now to good, entertain good, the, wonderful. Uh, the crowd. So right ahead, Tex. Time. Step right out. Go ahead. All right. Come on there, Scott. Now you on up and in your life. There's a crack of thunder, Wally, to be followed by rain. Yes, it's... And Bob and Ray had just started the motor of their limousine. The chauffeur started the motor almost simultaneously with the first clap of thunder indicating a storm uh, overhead. A storm which certainly is going to dampen the spirits of some of the people there. I never thought they'd do anything like that, go off and leave us out here in the field in this pouring rain. Off they go in their clothes yeah, 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 to the leaves. Careful the birds, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. They might have known this the way it would have turned out. Ten fish it cost me to come up to this. And now I understand the bus driver's lost the keys to the bus. Oh, oh no! no. Oh, we'll be here till, I don't know, next week sometime. And if they call this a state park, boy, we ought to get our taxes back. Maybe if some of those hog collars left, they'll drive us back to town. Well, that's about it, well, ladies and gentlemen. Artie, will you come over here and help me with the sign-off? I think our time is pretty near up. I think around. maybe if you uh, take off your jacket and put it over the microphone, uh, that they won't pick up too much of the, uh, the sound of the rain hitting at the mic. It's too bad that uh, such an auspicious day as this should end. Uh, what's that over there? Water moccasin? Yes. This uh, is a disgruntled, uh, unhappy group. Uh, I might point out at this time, it started off uh, in a very happy way, but now it seems to have more or less dwindled off into a catastrophe in public relations for Bob and Ray. Well, it's unfortunate that it should have turned out this way. I'm soaking wet. I, is that I a drip dry really suit? Hold no, it is not. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, we better sign off for them then, I guess. Uh, okay. Yes, as they would say, uh, uh, this is Addie Skirmahorn or uh, Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. And uh, Wally Ballou for Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. Oh, yeah. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, from coast to coast, approximately, Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding are very pleased and delighted to present the CBS Radio Network. Okay, Whistlers, back again here at the Bob and Ray Show. Boy, you realize another weekend is upon us already? That's right. I want to thank you for the mail that uh, we've received. Have any big plans for this uh, weekend? No, no, just going to... Stay around, mow the lawn. 
Get that all down, huh? Yeah. I guess most people will be, too. Somebody uh, stopped me on the street the other day and said, uh, Ray, what's happening uh, with all of your touring units? They said to me. Well, First uh, I said, I'm Bob, and went through that. They made that mistake. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I was talking to Wilbur Connolly. He's the young squirt who works for us uh, just this morning on that. He said that uh, the great, huge dead whale that we've been exhibiting for over four or five years is uh, doing rush business in Bridgeport. You mean the folks up Bridgeport, Connecticut way are going to get a chance to look at Smelly Dave? That's right. He'll be there this coming weekend. Uh, Have we uh, uh, arranged for enough ice to be... Uh, Loaded onto the boxcar, so... That's right. Uh, crushed ice by the ton. Uh, what was the figure last year on ice alone that we surrounded? Well, it was with? several hundred tons, uh, not counting that week that we ran out, if you remember. Or during the hot spell. Yeah. That's right. That, that was, was embarrassing. They were out uh, in uh, Iowa, I think it was, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Des Moines. It was in Des Moines. Yes. Uh, uh, siding, railroad uh, siding. It's on a huge flat car that we purchased years ago, and... Uh, it really is something to see. It has uh, bunting around it. A red and white bunting, and there's a platform. You can walk around and look at Dave. Uh, Dave is uh, 80 feet long, and... Uh, he was, right. In healthy days, uh, he weighed, uh, was it 200 ton, it was estimated by... Much as 18 elephants, I think I read somewhere. Somebody up at the... Some of uh, our poop that we put out on it. Some of the uh, officials up at the uh, Oceanographic... Oceanogra- How do you say that? Uh, well, that's as close as I can Graphic Institute at Woods Hole, Massachusetts... Uh, told us uh, we should take it to sea and drop it. <laughs> well, we didn't take his advice because uh, we thought we could make a fast buck out of it, and it's been quite successful. So look for it in your town on the Bob and Ray Touring Unit number 18. 18, I think it is. right. Okay, Maxie, uh, get this and get it straight. We walk into the bank real cool, just like we belong there, see? And casual-like, we stroll over to the teller's window, the one on the left, and shove the note to the guy. The note says? Right there on it. It's got, uh, please, sir, would like to sign up for the bond a month plan. That's it, huh? The rest is gravy. They put those great U.S. savings bonds aside for as regular as clockwork. In about nine years, we'll blow town, take a trip to Acapulco. Heat, nah? I mean, neat, huh? They'll call you Chicken Carruthers for nothing, Chief. This is the show on which we introduce a new feature called Salute the Honor City. From time to time, we're going to select, uh, by technical means, a city around the country and salute it on the Bob and Ray Show. And we're ready for our Honor City salute number one. Bob, where is the... Where's the piece of paper with the name of the city? Can I give it to you? No. I did. I... Play, the... Play a little longer, will you, musicians? Uh, no, all I'm we sure have I here did. is the commercial for uh, Columbia Phonographs. I don't Let see me look through my paper. stuff here. Keep it going, will you? Talk us for just a second. No, I don't have it. Either. Well, it was How about that pile of uh, paper? No, let me see. Oh, he's ending now. we got to... You look. know what it is, engineer? I don't know. Well... Uh, we lost the name of the city. Uh, we'll have to do it. We'll look it up, do it some, some other, other time. time. Sorry about it. Say, uh, stand by right now for what we believe is one of the most unusual and exciting offers ever to have been made by our Bob and Ray Laboratories. Today we announce our latest kit, the Help Bob and Ray to Fame and Fortune and a Worry-Free Old Age Kit. Now, so many of you have asked, how can I help you, fellas? What can I do to give you less to worry about? Isn't there some way you can be assured of a tidy little nest egg on which to retire? Well, now we're happy to say it is possible. Listen to what you'll get. First, a common pin to stick in your radio dial, locking the pointer into position on your CBS station so you'll never miss the program. Second, a piece of skin color adhesive tape to raise the corners of your mouth giving you the appearance of having a permanent wry grin while you listen to us. The kit also contains a sign to attach to the front end of your automobile which says, I'm on my way to listen to the Bob and Ray Show. Plus, another sign to attach to the rear of your automobile which says, I've just been listening to the Bob and Ray Show. And now, listen to this, gang. You'll get a neatly printed poster to hang over your TV screen when we're on. The poster reads, I'm listening to CBS Radio on the Bob and Ray Show. 
Just specify what size TV screen you have. Included in the kit is a postcard addressed to your local CBS station, which says, Holy cow, I think Bob and Ray have the funniest program on the air. Sure, I want full details on how I can help them to wealth and happiness in their dotage. Rush information. I understand I'll be under some kind of obligation, too. And here's something extra. If you order right away, we'll include absolutely free a beautiful simulated plastic lapel pin which says in rich-looking old English script, You bet your boots, readers of my lapel button, that I am behind Bob and Ray and am doing my utmost to ensure them when they become cranky and senile, their worries will not be monetary. So hurry up now and get in on this once-in-a-lifetime offer from the Bob and Ray Laboratory. For all the material, plus the simulated plastic lapel pin for promptness, write today to Aging Bob and Ray, CBS Radio, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. That's Aging Bob and Ray, CBS Radio, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. Yes, sir. And friends, <clears throat> right here, we'd like to tell you that we've done it again. What's that? We've, We've done it again. Yes, huh? we have. The uh, wooden beams of our overstocked warehouse are creaking in protest as they're pushed outward by the enormous influx of what we have to offer. What we have to offer is so microscopically low priced that even those who are hopelessly broke can afford it. At great expense. We practically pauperized ourselves. At great expense. To tell them about the trepidation, too, Ray. All right, Bob, we approached the former owners of this item with great trepidation. And at great expense, we managed to purchase from the Cutler Novelty Company. 26,000 squirting carnations. Lifelike rubber petals. Blush pink in hue. Three feet of 1 16th rubber tubing. And a rubber bulb with an intake valve capable of holding one-third of a pint of water. Now, ordinarily, these squirting carnations would bring fantastically high over-the-counter prices. However, the novelty engineer at Cutler's made a once-in-a-lifetime error. The nozzles through which the water squirts all face the wrong way. Now, you you're all probably saying to yourselves, what can this bring me except a wet lapel? But with a little enterprise, you can get the other fellow to wear one. That's right. You can settle accounts with that office pest. Give one to that newsstand dealer who hides the hard-to-get newspapers when he sees you coming. And the carnation has other uses, functional ones. Fill the bulb with insect repellent and keep flies and other bugs off your lapel. Or you ladies can place the squirting carnation in a vase with your other flowers. Slight pressure on the bulb will flood the vase with energy giving water in no time. And for that little boy who loves to eat, if the carnation is removed from the 1 16th rubber tubing, your lad can drain the gravy from his plate by inserting the tube in it and exerting a mild pressure on the bulb. And he'll have one third of a pint of gravy, which he can take along to school to fight off those hunger pangs. And the same process, of course, can be used to siphon gas. And here's a feature we haven't yet discussed. If you buy one dozen squirting carnations and remove the rubber tubing and bulbs from them all, you'll have a short, spongy bouquet to give your loved one. All this at a price so phenomenally low that our own bank has just classified us as enormously poor business risk. Friends, get your squirting carnation today. For full particulars, just address a postcard to Fool CBS Radio, 485 Madison Avenue, New York City. And it'll reach us. Okay. You know it. The engineer is nodding, Bob, which would indicate that uh, Wally Blue has called in. No, no, sleeping? No. Oh, no. Wally Blue has called in, and uh, he's up in New Britain, Connecticut, for another remote broadcast. This is radio's blonde-haired Wally Ballou, winner of 27 Diction Awards, speaking to you from a factory in central Connecticut. And uh, standing beside me is a gentleman who probably has more to do with an industry that has been prominently in the news the past uh, year or so than anyone else that I could uh, think to interview. My assignment sheet said, go to jukebox factory. And here is the manager, Mr. Tony... Uh, Gifford. Gifford. Tony L.B. Gifford. Uh, Mr. Gifford, uh, you are in charge here of turning out all of these jukeboxes. That's that right. right? Uh, that's right, Mr. Ballou. Uh, this factory has been in business since shortly after the last international misunderstanding. We went into business in 1948. Uh -huh. uh, from that time uh, on, uh, we have been increasing our production of these uh, jukeboxes because of the increasing demand for them. I might say that the first reaction to be a highly regarded radio reporter upon seeing the inside of your factory yes. is that nothing looks like anything I've ever seen before. By that I mean, 
Be I careful. don't see anything. Careful over there. That faintly new resembles the jukebox. Boy. Uh, <laughs> faintly resembles. I say I don't see yes. anything that does. Well, faintly of resemble. course, right here, uh, Mr. Ballou, we're in the fabricating division. Uh, you just saw that young fellow over there, Wilbur, working on uh, yes. the, the... Well, now, he takes the, uh, the, the... He puts the box together, actually, and then it's uh, varnished and painted and sent out uh, to the warehouse where they're packed and shipped uh, to various distributing points around not only America, but all over the globe. We do an international jukebox business here. That I understand, but what I meant was, I don't, well, where does the the, rec the uh, needle arm, uh, where is that assembled, and where are the record racks and uh, the colored things that go up and down in the front of the jukebox, where are those put on? Well, we, uh, we've never made a jukebox uh, such as you described. We, uh, we have uh, used colors. Uh, we've painted them orange and green and blue and different colors uh, like that, but... Uh, well, you don't make the kind that light up, then, I guess. No, these do not light up. No, these are just simply for carrying jute, of course. The what? Jute, carrying jute. J-U-T-E? Right, jute box. Well, I have uh, evidently hit the wrong spot for my assignment. It was jute boxes I was supposed to... This is it, jute boxes. Juke boxes. Of what? The... Juke, J-U-K-E, that uh, the kind that make music, you know. Well, you're a jerk if you thought this juke factory was... Now this is radio's Wally Ballou returning it to Bob and Ray in... Another competent, complete, colorful Wally Ballou report. Because uh, so much of our show is completely visual, uh, as you know. And uh, if you uh, if you can't see it, then you're missing probably three quarters of it. Wouldn't you say, uh, Bob? I, I would say that. I've, I've always found that... Uh, Actually, the experience of seeing a Bob and Ray show from the audience is much more heartening and... Uh, the way you fellas uh, move about, uh, or we fellas, I should say, move about and, uh, and make uh, wonderful facial uh, expressions, uh, I, I think is so much a big part of uh, the show that those of you who are listening on radio are deprived of, uh, well, I think, maybe 90% of uh, the enjoyment of the show, the see, more you, I think about it. You people listening on radio could have a picture go along you with could, it. If you could see the face that Bob... <laughs> Gee, if they could only invent something if, like that. Oh, if you just saw the face he made when he said that, wouldn't it be great <laughs> if they could come up with something whereby they could see a show and hear it at the same time? Oh, what do you mean? You mean you sit there at home and... Uh, have the radio turn on. And see the guy? And see well, the or they, or the person, or persons? Well, they couldn't get a picture on that cloth that covers the speaker. Well, yeah, there. I tell you what, if they can hit the moon, boy, I think uh, human uh, human beings can come up with something like that. And uh, I would be the last one to bet against it. Uh, you, Bob, or Ray, now? Transmit a picture through the air. I'm Bob. Bob. Uh, uh, you're spoiling my train of thought now. I'm Sorry. just trying to... I'm, I'm rather technical. <laughs> just uh, just watching you then as you were trying to think of a of something there. Did I have a good funny. facial expression there? <laughs> you know, Wonderful. I'm sorry everybody's missing these because they could mean something. Time now for our Bob and Ray Good Neighbor Award for the month of August. And although the month isn't quite over, we've already discovered the one that we believe is most deserving. Let's put it this way, Bob, that if anyone does a good deed in the remaining few days of August, they will have to be judged in September. <laughs> That's all. So that because we were so anxious to give this uh, award to uh, our lady guest, who's seated here with me now and who is going to tell her own story of the achievement which earned her the Bob and Ray Merritt Award as a good neighbor for the month of August. Would you sign in, please, ma'am? Yes, Mrs. Mallory Stuckenhernmoth. Mrs. Stuckenhernmoth, we heard about the good deed that you performed through the letter sent by one of your neighbors. I mean, I believe it was Mrs. Margaret Stuckenhernmoth. Yes, that's my... She's some relation? She's or? my sister. Mm-hmm. Yes. What was it that she wrote to us? Well, she wrote to you about the nice deed I did for the next door neighbor. This is the neighbor on the other side. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Coburns. Well, anyway, the, uh, their house was on fire one evening, and uh, they came over. Mr. Coburn came over, fit to be tied. And uh, I should imagine. 
He came over to borrow uh, our hose, and uh, I couldn't find it. Uh, it was down cellar somewhere, and he didn't have time to uh, rummage about. So uh, I suggested that he take a bucket of water with him. I had a pail handy there. I see. You provided him with a pail. And an entire bucket full of water. And then I gave him a bottle of prune juice to throw on the flames. It was the only thing liquid I had around the house. The fire? Was, yes. The fire, of course, was raging out of hand uh, right. all this time next door. Then uh, he, I also gave him a glass of water to uh, keep his false teeth in. Uh -huh. I don't imagine he was thinking too much about that at the time, do you? Well, I mean, still, it does falls think in line with being things. a good neighbor, just He the thinks same. of all those things. Mm -hmm. And then after the house had burned down, uh, that everyone just, Miss, Mr. Coburn lived there alone. He was fine, but the house burned down. Mm -hmm. And what uh, little they, uh, that he managed to save from the flame was sitting in front of the smoldering ruins. Yes. And, uh... I gave him a shelter half that my nephew Lyle left there. An army shelter half, just half. Right, and then I gave him a box of marshmallows to hold over the embers of the fire so we could have a bite to eat. And wasn't there something about your inviting him into the uh, into your house where he could uh, find shelter until he was able to rebuild his house? Uh, no. What I did for him was to move my TV set near the window so he could look in and watch it at night. Well, Mrs. Stuckenheim Moth, we certainly want to thank you for coming here today and telling your story in your own words. Well, it's a deed that I'd do again. And you certainly have proved that you were a good neighbor for August to Mr. Coburn out there, and we want you to have this pop-up toaster, symbol of... The Bob and Ray organization has been well, really Well, if it's a symbol it. of the Bob and Ray organization, then that's one thing I'll remember. And uh, after the show, you can pick up uh, your toaster in a choice of colors. They're there at the back of the studio. Are they anything like the Columbia phonographs? I mean, the colors? Well, the colors are similar, yes. Yeah. You can probably get one to match your Fine. Columbia phonograph. All right. Thank Fine. you, Mrs. Stuckenheimoff. <laughs> that's uh, kind of a hard word to remember. Or a name, I should say. No, a time signal. Well, <laughs> we don't have uh, too much time for a time signal. We have some uh, some things here that uh, we wanted to uh, remind you. Who's this gentleman standing over there by that microphone? You there? I don't know. What? Uh, well, you're talking into a microphone over there, sir? No, I'm not. Well, uh, sotto voce I am, yes. Sotto what? Sotto voce. Kind of quiet. Like. Oh, I see. Well, what are you saying? I mean, uh, Well, I'm just more or less thinking. It's subliminal advertising. You're an advertising man. That's right, I am, yes. Uh, I have my own agency. Well, then we're happy to welcome Madison Avenue to our well, uh, show this evening. Well, no, uh, actually, uh, our, uh, our office is not on Madison Avenue. We're over in Brooklyn, but we're shooting for Madison oh, Avenue. Oh, it's uh, kind of an off-Madison Avenue agency. Yeah, more have. or less like that. But uh, we think that there's probably a pretty good chance for this. Uh, this subliminal that... stuff where, where they kind of sneak in something. Was that, that It's only been tried out on TV, I think. I don't think radio has ever had it. Well, uh, you know, there's a first for everything. I'd be quite curious, uh, you see, I've been thinking into that microphone uh, since you've been on the air, and I'll be curious to see if uh, you get any mail. If anybody People knows get the message. What, you're, what you're trying to get across yeah. there. Right? Uh, I'll be. I'll leave my card and my phone number here with you, Bob. But uh, right. in case anyone calls up with a message uh, or uh, or writes a card, you'll uh, let me know. Will All you? right, we'll get right in Great. touch with you. Sure. Wonderful. Hello, Bob and Ray Show. Uh, I don't know if we haven't had any. What? I don't know uh, whether this is the message, uh, uh, but I thought I was getting a message. Uh, you did. That's quick reaction. What did you think he was thinking in, into the microphone there? Well, I had a feeling that uh, somebody is yelling, come out, dinner is ready. Come out, dinner is ready. Well, that may be it. We'll check. He's left now, but we'll uh, we'll check. Hang up the phone. Come out and dinner is ready. Somebody is calling you for dinner, I think. So. Oh, well, and Better I hang said, up. yeah, I'm rock. And we better hang up, too, until tomorrow. We'll have a preview of something Bob will say on tomorrow's show in ten seconds. And now here's Bob with his preview. We're a little late, so we got to say so long, folks. Until tomorrow, this is Ray Goulding reminding you all to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumb.
This is the CBS Radio Network. All right, those were a bunch of Bob and Ray snippets. Now, let me tell you, Jake, it was rather refreshing to hear those and actually be able to hear them because that's always been my issue with Bob and Ray is whenever I tried to get into their stuff, you know, I heard a lot about them. So whenever I tried to get into their stuff, I would listen to it and I could not for the life of me understand a single word of what they were saying. Yeah, the, just the copies of the... Because I think what it was, was it wasn't the type of show that was like a like a, like a sponsored show, half-hour slot. Because usually what they would do is they would do their comedy bits around uh, music. They were more like a... Uh, they were more like disc jockeys, kind of, who did comedy bits in between playing music. That was a lot of what their show was. And so it wasn't really preserved by the stations, usually. So the copies that you find, a lot of times, are... Um, Fan recordings, because they they were kind of a cult thing. Mm. Like they were big with like yeah. college kids, so a lot of fan recordings. Yeah, but I think their 1959 CBS series was preserved. Like you can find all the episodes of their 1959 series, but yeah, terrible audio quality. I don't know why. It's just yeah. Yeah, because I first heard like a a snippet of them, and I could kind of understand what they were saying and hear a joke or two here and there. But then finding out that this was sort of uh, not necessarily a real structured real quote-unquote program and that this was kind of just um ad-lib studio banter made a lot of sense to me because it kind of sounded like it was accidentally recorded it sounded like it but was she just, just accidentally a dropped in on a couple of guys goofing around yeah well, that's yeah, kind of yeah. why i liked it but anyway anyway that's that's our show for today yeah uh, yesterday today i am drowning in a pool of sweat over here so we're gonna get this out of is, here this is and, getting uh, bad guys um, let me go find one of those air-conditioned movie theaters i've heard so much about do they have air conditioning in movies now oh yeah that's a new thing McLean. they're air conditioning oh. the movie theaters First talkies and now this. <laughs> it's a crazy world we live in. See you next week, folks. Doesn't the popcorn get cold, though? Uh...